let's get going and review the uh, learning objectives for tonight. We're going to identify what requirements exist in USP 825 for performing radiochemical purity testing. We're also going to look at the standards of practice of the ACR, American College of Radiology, and the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. We'll then get a little bit into chemistry and review the structure activity relationships. What is there that determines where this radiopharmaceutical is going to go or the biorouting? Why does it go here and not there? We'll then discuss how radiochemical purity testing separates radiochemical species. I want the good stuff, I want the bad stuff, and I want them separate so I can quantify those two species. We'll then look at the different solid phases and liquid phases used in radiochemical purity testing. In essence, the strips and the solvents. And then we'll look at different counting devices, um, instrumentation, an example of how the math is handled to determine radiochemical purity percentage. And then last of all, look at minimal acceptable purity levels for the different radiopharmaceuticals. Again, uh, I'm Richard Green, board certified nuclear pharmacist. I'll be joined with by uh, Brian Scott, uh, certified nuclear medicine technologist, and he'll be talking about uh, ways to capture record keeping and perform quality control testing. As Sean mentioned, I did uh, serve as a volunteer member on the expert panel that wrote the chapter, but I do need to point out that this presentation is not endorsed by USP, nor does it represent the views or opinions of USP. So let's start at the beginning. QC testing of radiopharmaceuticals is required by USP, and here's the direct quote. It's found in section 10. The individual responsible for preparing the radiopharmaceutical must ensure that the final preparation complies with quality and purity specifications throughout the assigned beyond use date. This includes as appropriate for the preparation, radionuclidic purity, radiochemical purity, chemical purity, as well as physical and chemical properties. In addition to this section 10, there's a statement found in section nine regarding documentation. You have to have applicable records, hard copy or electronic, that include policies and procedures, SOPs. They must be maintained for all activities involved in repackaging, preparing, preparing with minor deviations, compounding and dispensing radiopharmaceuticals. Such records include, but are not limited to, and one of the, I think, six bullets in that section says, Records should include end product radiochemical purity and other testing as applicable, results of preparation, preparation with minor deviations, and compounded preparations. So that's what it says in USP 825. Let's look at the standards of practice, both of the American College of Radiology as well as SNMMI. So ACR comes first alphabetically. Here's the link to their document. It's their technical standards for the preparation for the diagnostic procedures using radiopharmaceuticals. The qualified individual performing radiopharmaceutical tasks share responsibility for the safety and quality of all RPs with which he or she is involved. Radiopharmaceuticals prepared on site should be subjected to quality control testing, especially for radiochemical purity. Radiopharmaceuticals should not be administered if the level of impurity exceeds package insert or USP monograph specifications. Just for a little background, that uh, ACR document uh, latest revision is from 2016. It's been revised nine times and originally came out in 1994. It's not new. SNMMI states in their procedure guideline for the use of radiopharmaceuticals, that a comprehensive radiopharmaceutical quality control program should be developed and implemented. The scope of the program should be compatible with the type of practice and the availability of equipment and personnel. The parameters to monitor in a radiopharmaceutical quality control program include chemical purity, radiochemical purity, radionuclidic purity, biologic purity, and pharmaceutical purity. SNMLI's documents from 2007. Again, it is not new. So we have a, a trifecta here where the ACR, SNM, as well as USP 825 say that radiochemical purity testing should be a part of nuclear medicine practice. So let's go and move to our next topic. And, and we're going to use a, a fancy term here. It's structure activity relationship. That's chemistry speaking for what part of the molecule determines where it goes. How are we going to get this drug from here to there? Why does it show up in 
various parts of the body and various tissues and various organ systems. It may be something as simple as the physical size of the particle. There are radiopharmaceuticals on the market today that are small enough that they're filtered through from the blood through the reticuloendothelial system and therefore we get distribution to the bone, liver, uh, sorry, liver, spleen, and bone marrow. An example of that is technetium sulfur colloid. There are other pharmaceuticals that are larger in physical dimension, large enough to block the capillaries in the pulmonary system. MAA is the classic example of a capillary blockade drug that localizes in the lung. There are drugs that have chemical properties. Um, for example, sodium protectatate. Another example is uh, sodium pentatate or DTPA that are highly charged. And because they're charged molecules, they're water soluble. And because they're water soluble, they get excreted in the urine and therefore we see the urinary system, kidneys, ureters, and bladder. There are other drugs that are lipophilic and that's a fancy term that means fat loving. They are uh, electron dense, not charged. They're, they're um, polar molecules and they can distribute into the fats of the body, whether that's a bisisate, neurolite, or exometazine. One brand of that is Ceratec. That is brain imaging, as well as mebrofinin. It's uh, fatty enough that it will distribute into the gallbladder uh, just as if it was uh, bilirubin, the bile salts that are used to emulsify fats that we consume in our diets. So those fat-loving molecules can distribute to those portions of the body. There are also molecules that uh, localize on a ligand. Uh, you know, the um, receptor sites, um, the classic one in nuclear medicine is indium-111 octrea scan or pentatriotide. The newer variant of that is gallium-68 dotatate. Again, there's receptor sites for re somatostat receptors. And the same process is used by technetium tomanosat for sentinel node imaging. It binds to a receptor and stays there. And that's why it can be imaged uh, many hours after administration because it binds to the receptor site. There's also um, cellular mechanisms that revolve around the, the molecular size or charge. Sodium iodide-131, sodium iodide-123 uses the cellular transport system and that's why they end up in the thyroid and then they get organified and we get uh, images of thyroid shape as well as function studies in, in nuclear medicine. So there's chemical reasons why drugs, radiopharmaceuticals, go to different places. This is a graphic, a visual indication of all 17 prepared radiopharmaceuticals that come today as non-radioactive lyophilized vials that you can add a radioactive isotope to. And uh, three of these are non-technesium, gallium dotatate, net spot, indium-111 pentatriotide or octrea scan. And the one in the bottom right corner is yttrium-90 itramomab texatan or zevalin. The other 14 drugs are all technesium labeled. And they are gonna go in different places because of their chemical structure. Right there in the center of the page, look at that mebrofinin molecule. This half the molecule is in acetic acid groups. It's charged, it's water soluble. This half the molecule is a benzene ring that's substituted with three methyl groups and a bromine, lots of electron density here. This is the portion of the molecule that gets it into the biliary salts. Here's DTPA right below it. This is pentatate, there are five acetic acid portions here. It's very charged, very water soluble. It goes out in the urine. Here's Sestamibi in the bottom right hand corner here. This looks like a snowflake, but it's actually a, a isonitrile group. It's a nitroglycerin derivative. And of course we know that nitroglycerin is the fact that delivers this to the myocardial tissue for myocardial perfusion imaging. So each of these molecules has a, a 
structure, a chemistry, a size, MA is purely by size, so for coal it is purely by size, that localizes it in a different part of the body. What we're doing in the radio labeling process of a lyophilized radiopharmaceutical, looking at protectinate as our example, is we're going to disguise that protectinate. So here's protectinate that we know and love. It's sodium salts, sodium protectinate, got a minus one charge on the anion. And when you inject that intravenously, it is FDA approved for intravenous administration for salivary gland, thyroid, Meckel's diverticulum. Uh, it shows three organs of distribution. And then because it's water soluble, renally excreted, it shows us three organs of excretion, kidneys, ureter, and bladder. This is the fingerprint, if you will, of sodium protectinate. Well, what we're gonna do, chemically speaking, when we're making a drug vial is disguise that. Put some of these uh, comical glasses with a rubber nose on it and make it look different. We're gonna change it into a drug molecule such as technesium medronate or MDP. This image does not look like the image on the left. It's not pertechnitate, it's medronate. Here we see the distribution to the hydroxyapatite crystal showing us the skeletal tissues in the body, all of the uh, osseous bones. And uh, if we've made the drug correctly, we see something different. We've disguised protectinate and made it into a different drug. Now here's an excerpt from that nuclear medicine uh, SNMMI procedure guidelines, and I've highlighted, I think, the important part. The distribution of the radiopharmaceutical within the body is determined by the physiochemical properties of the drug. So we've got to make that drug correctly so it goes to the right part of the body. We want to get the organ system the physician has prescribed the procedure for. Now, you can prepare a radiopharmaceutical and it can fail. What are some of these potential causes of failure? Well, have you got the right drug? If, if the doctor prescribed a uh, mebrofenin study for a gallbladder and you have inadvertently grabbed a vial of medronate, you're not gonna see a gallbladder, you're gonna see some bones. You cannot rely on the color of the cap. You need to read the label. And uh, often, sometimes, uh, uh, radiochemical purity testing can identify, whoops, you've got the wrong drug here. All of our technesium drugs, except one, have a tin reduction system. We're gonna borrow electrons from this molecule and give them to that molecule. It'll allow us to chelate and label a, a structure that will localize where we want it to. But this tin reduction system has to be protected from oxidation. And of course, the classic oxidizer is oxygen. So these drug vials are sealed under an inert gas of either nitrogen gas or argon gas. If there's a small crack in the glass vial and that gas has gone, your kit's going to fail. If there's inappropriate venting, if you're withdrawing doses and replacing volume with oxygen from the room, you're going to have that kit fail over time and you're not going to get uh, gallbladders, bones, lungs, or livers. You will get the presence and image of free protectinate. Continuing on that discussion about uh, oxidation and the tin reduction system, we realize that the protectinate we're handling has two flavors of technesium in it. There's both Tech 99M with a six hour half life that we want and we can image on our gamma camera, and Tech 99 that we cannot image and we don't really want, but we got to realize it's there. That's the 215,000 year half life quasi-stable technesium. Both are always present, and that ratio will increase with time as Tech 99M decays, it becomes Tech 99. You have to have sufficient tin in your drug vial and sufficient freshness of your protectinate to handle the activity you're using. You've got to have enough tin to reduce the entire amount of technesium present, both 99 and 99M. Some of the drugs that are prepared require incubation. Um, Neurolite, 
many of you have room temperature incubations for a length of time. Um, most of the drugs have uh, requirements for volume and activity. And if you're staying within the right parameters, you should have success. There are four drugs today that require heating, three of which are to boiling, one of which is not boiling, but warm. Uh, MAG-3, sulfurcolloid, sestamibi, and NetSpot require a heating process. Many of the drugs require that ingredients are added in the correct order. Sulfurcolloid requires acid before base. If it's in the wrong order, it will not work. Um, Zevalin and Octreoscan, I believe, have a, a acetate buffer solution that's got to be added to the indium chloride or yttrium chloride to adjust the pH, otherwise you're going to denature that poor antibody protein. So it's important that things happen in the right order. I want to point out that when you're making these radiopharmaceuticals, you are not reconstituting a vial because you're not putting back something that's been taken out. Yes, these vials have been freeze dried and lyophilized where they've removed the water, but they didn't take out the protectinate. There never was protectinate there. We're adding protectinate. We're doing chemistry. We're sharing electrons, doing tin reduction systems to make a new molecule that will localize and biodistribute somewhere different in the body than the precursor molecule. So we've got to make sure the drug is good before it's used. In my opinion, in vivo QC is not okay. The patient is here for a procedure, not the roll of the dice. If the doctor has prescribed a, a mebrofenin study for patency of the gallbladder, looking for gallstones, well, we should know ahead of time whether the drug is good before it's put into the patient so we know that the patient will have a quality examination. So let's look at QC testing of what's really going on. And, and I am hopefully can simplify this so that it makes sense. I think there are two simple rules that apply. Let's go through each of these two rules. The first one is like dissolves like. If a drug is soluble, in a particular solvent, it will migrate in that solvent. So we're using a small piece of paper in a container of liquid. It'll climb up the page by um, capillary action, and it'll climb up that page. And I like to think of the surfer surfing up that wave as it climbs the page. If it's soluble, it moves with the solvent and climbs the page. If it's not soluble in that solvent, it will stay at the bottom where you put it. And that's the little girl with the floaties on her arms. She can't go in the deep water. She's not surfing. She's going to stay at the bottom. So that's the first rule of thumb is like dissolves like. The second rule of thumb is, is equally simple. Chunks don't move. Solid particles will not migrate uphill or through a membrane rocks don't roll uphill. So there are tech MAA, it'll always stay where you put it. The impurity will move. Tech sulfurcolloid will always stay where you put it. It's a, it's a particulate. Uh, hydrolyzed reduced technesium is an impurity that will mimic a particulate and it'll stay where you put it. Other things will move. So that's a rock. So we can use these two simple rules to explain what's going on in the chromatography process. So let's um, look at one drug, in, just as an example. Let's look at technesium 99M medronate, or MDP for bone scans. We need to use two different strips to identify all of the elements in this drug. So we're going to put a little drop of technesium MDP on the bottom origin line of this small piece of paper. It's about eight centimeters tall perhaps one centimeter wide. It's a little piece of paper, about as long as your, your index finger. And we'll put that spotted QC strip into a developing tank that's got a small volume of acetone. Acetone is an organic solvent. It's, it's paint thinner or, or um, fingernail polish remover. It stinks. And MDP is water soluble and it is not miscable. It will not 
migrate or move with acetone. So what remains at the bottom of this strip is the hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed reduced particles, because that's rocks don't roll uphill, they remain at the bottom of the page. And the labeled MDP, which is not soluble in acetone, will also remain where you put it at the bottom of the page. She cannot swim in deep water. She's not soluble in that solvent. What is soluble is free protectinate. Free protectinate will move in acetone. It climbs to the top of the page. So here we've got this red contaminate isolated. This is what we've identified and can quantify on this acetone strip. There's a second strip required for full QC of MDP, and that's a saline strip. Same process, we put a drop of MDP on the bottom of the strip right by the pencil line, put it into a small developing tank containing normal saline, and let that climb by capillary action. Now, again, rocks don't roll uphill. What might be present that's acting like a rock, hydrolyzed reduced protectinate or tin colloid, will not leave the origin. Rocks don't roll uphill. We have two other species that are present potentially in this labeled pharmaceutical. Obviously, we want the labeled MDP, which should surf to the top of the page, but also free protectinate is soluble in saline and will move to the top of the page. So we've got two species commingled here. We can't separate, but we do have one contamination that we've isolated by itself. So these two strips together will help us quantify how much impurity we have, and by subtraction, how much labeled MDP we have in this preparation. So when we're doing QC, we're using both stationary phases and solvents, papers and liquids. And as the solvent moves up by capillary action, it'll move the drug with it if it's soluble in that solvent. The illustration here is, is a one that's it's often done in elementary school or, or high school chemistry classes. Small drops of food coloring in glasses of water, and you can separate the different colors of that food coloring. We're doing the same thing with instant thin layer chromatography with, with radio pharmaceuticals, but they're invisible. We cannot see them, but we can detect them with our radiometric detection systems. So we're going to be able to separate labeled drug pre-isotope, perhaps intermediate species, by separating them out with chromatography. Now, you can't willy-nilly uh, mishmash these together. There's a particular paper chosen and a particular solvent chosen so that you can affect the chemistry of that drug and separate out mebrofenin, good and bad. MAG-3 is a different system. You can separate good and bad. Uh, Sestamibi, you know, good and bad. So each drug will have a defined paper and solvent system to separate out the different species present there. Of the mobile phases, there are several water-like solvents. The most common of which is 0.9% or normal saline. 20% saline, a, a salt solution. Distilled water can be used for some drugs. And there's some drugs that call for a 0.05 molar DTPA solution as a scavenger. That's what's uh, occurring with uh, Zevalin. There are organic solvents that are used. These are all um, smelly. Um, acetone, paint thinner, fingernail polish, ethyl acetate, ethyl alcohol, methyl ethyl ketone. Um, we'll talk more about these organic solvents in a minute, but they're all going to be used, paired up with the right paper to separate different radiochemical species. Speaking of paper, there's a different collection of media that may be used. Uh, Wattman paper is one of the most common. It's, it's cellulose or wood pulp, and there's different grades, one, two, three, three double M. They all have different thicknesses and rigidity and speed of travel, but they're all cellulose. There's also silica gel, or it's instant thin layer chromatography, or ITLC-SG. And there's a variant called SA, which has been acidified silica acid. Uh, plastic aluminum oxide plates, as well as the uh, C18 setpack cartridges you can see displayed on the screen. And so the, these will be selected by the manufacturer, referenced in the package insert, perhaps. 
to identify what strips and solvents are used for particular drugs. So you will need some supplies for your QC program. Uh, let's start off with the developing chambers. I've got illustrated here two small glass vials that have had the rubber stopper ripped out and the aluminum crimp removed, and they're staining on top of each other to make an enclosed environment. If this was saline, you only need the bottom container because saline is water and does not evaporate rapidly, where an organic solvent like acetone does evaporate and you must have a closed system with any organic solvent. If you didn't have that top vial in closing the entire system, it'll get to the top of the vial and then evaporate like an air freshener. So with any organic solvent, you have to have a closed system. You're also gonna need the uh, small QC syringes. Uh, they're easier to use than using a standard 3ml patient dose syringe to get a small drop and place that on the paper where, where desired. Tweezers, scissors, to be able to cut your strips into sections to be able to count the top versus the bottom. Let's talk about counting instrumentation. There are several different types of instruments and they, they all have uh, positives and negatives, pluses and minuses. And um, I've got them ranked in, in what I believe is, is the appropriate uh, uh, value um, and utility. There, there are uh, very new elegant strip scanners that are on the market today where you could take the developed um, paper strip and not cut it. Just lay it down, it gets fed in the machine and counted, and it gives you a graph, an image with area under the curve calculated and percent data right there. You could use a multi-channel analyzer or an MCA. You'd have to cut the strip into different pieces and put them in test tubes and count them one at a time, but you can do that. That's how we've done it in nuclear medicine, radio pharmacy for years, although we are migrating towards a strip scanner now for efficiency. Most bioassay probes can be used, and many of them actually have MCAs built into that uh, moving console, or you can just merely use the, the uh, sodium iodide detector of the bioassay probe, as well as, of course, the gamma camera. The gamma camera with the parallel hole collimator can allow you to develop the strip and uh, cut it in half and place both pieces on a, a piece of paper to protect contamination from occurring and acquiring the images under the gamma camera um, and then making your regions of interest to quantify them. But these are what I call smart instruments. There's dead time correction. They can accommodate very high count rates, adjust for hot samples and, and display images of what you're looking at. They can distinguish live time versus just chronological time or clock time. Other events that could be used in QC testing is a Geiger counter with a pancake probe. Yes, it's not elegant, but it works. You could uh, develop your strip, cut it into upper and lower pieces, and uh, put them in test tubes and put them on the face of the pancake probe. Now, at some point, the meter will peg, and you'll have to turn that knob to the next multiplier, and you'll probably set it on low, slow response speed so it doesn't uh, dance the needle all over the place. It, it moderates that needle movement, but you could get you know, 0.5 MR per hour off this side of the strip and 27 MR per hour off the other side of the strip, and you can do a ratio with that. A single channel analyzer is a machine that, that can work, but I consider that a dumb machine. It works on clock time only. It's unable to adjust for very hot samples. If it gets flooded, it won't tell you it's flooded. It just gives you a number that is erroneous. And last of all, in, in my selection, ranking would be a dose calibrator. They're very poor at measuring very low activities that we're encountering with quality control testing samples. And um, so I don't really recommend them. But what you're doing here is you're going through the process of, of uh, spotting QC strips. So in the red font at the top of the slide, I've given you the the cliff notes, prepare the chamber, spot the strip, develop the strip, cut the strip, and count the sections. That's, in summary, the process of radiochemical purity testing. 
So you put a small volume, about a quarter inch of solvent in that chamber, close the chamber if it's an organic solvent so it can saturate the vapor pressure, wear gloves so you don't get the oils from your fingers onto the paper. Of course, you're playing with radioactivity, you should have gloves on anyway, and put a small drop of that radiopharmaceutical you've prepared on the origin line, which should be a pencil line, and that's put down into the developing chamber, and then you close the lid. As that solvent climbs by capillary action, you'll see that colored line at the solvent front begin to blur and move. Hey, it's about time to pull it out. We're at the top of the page. Pull it out with a pair of tweezers, cut it into sections, upper and lower portion, or as is appropriate for the drug in question, and then count the two portions. What we're doing is we're determining a ratio. We want either the counts or the MR per hour or the microcuries that are the bad stuff. And we want to compare that to the total counts or MR per hour or microcuries that is in the entire QC strip. So we're always doing a calculation that is the percent contaminant is the contaminant counts or MR per hour or microcuries divided by the total counts or MR or microcuries times 100. Look at that pediatric bone scan on the right corner. Is that real? Is this really a two-headed child? I don't think so. That's an artifact. We know that child moved their head during image acquisition. That's an artifact. Well, we're trying to identify and exclude artifacts in QC testing. When you're counting the upper portion and then the lower portion, Make sure you use the same counting time. Use the same counting geometry. If you have one sample closer to the detector, you're going to have an entirely different count rate than what is truly there. As you're counting the top portion and the bottom portion, make sure you know which is top, which is bottom, which is saline, which is acetone. Don't have an artifact. And think about your implements. Uh, if you contaminate your tweezers, if you contaminate your solvents, you'll have erroneous data. And we don't want uh, an artifact showing up and um, bad drug be used in a patient, which ends up in, in the poor quality imagery. So let's look at the mathematical computation. How do we handle the math? And it's it's actually fairly simple. Remember, it's the percent contaminant is the contaminate quantified divided by the total times 100. So going back to that MDP example, we had an acetone strip where we identified the contaminants free tech at the top of the page. Good MDP and hydrolyzed reduced do not leave the origin. They're at the bottom. So let's put some numbers to this. If we had 258 counts on the top of this strip, and 18,741 on the bottom, we need to get a total, that's 18,999. Our calculation is contaminant divided by total times 100. We have 1.35% sodium protectinate contaminant identified and quantified on this acetone strip. The other strip was a saline strip. Same process, a drop of drug, put it in the developing chamber, Saline climbs up that page by capillary action. Hydrolyzed reduced never moves. It's a particulate. Rocks don't roll uphill. Protectinate and MDP both climb to the top of the page. So now we can separate and quantify our hydrolyzed reduced at the bottom of the page. Apply some numbers to this example. We had 20,295 counts on the top. That's good MDP and free tech. What remains at the bottom is the hydrolyzed reduced contaminant, 141 counts. We've got a total, 2246. Again, the same calculation, contaminant divided by total. We've got 0.69% hydrolyzed reduced. The good MDP is the sum of the contaminants subtracted from 100. In this example, we have a 97.96% good MDP. Now, is that good enough for use? Well, here's a list of all of the um, prepared radiopharmaceuticals and what their QC minimal acceptable purities are. 
and rather than uh, looking at this big list, let's make it simple for you. All of them are 90% except for five exceptions. Net spot is 95. Ceratec or Eximetazine is 80%. Sodium protectinate, straight tech is 95. Sulfur colloid or filtered sulfur colloid is 92% and Zevelin is 95, all the others are 90%. And again, this can be looked up in their package insert or the USP monograph. The link in blue at the bottom of the slide is the uh, Cardinal Health Library of all package inserts from all manufacturers of all radio pharmaceuticals. So you can look these up if you need to. Again, You'll need uh, some testing supplies. Uh, there are commercially available quality control manuals that are published and available commercially. Um, there are also firms that make, uh, an, in association with that quality control manual, QC papers and solvents that are available. Um, little QC syringes that we use have sharp little 30 gauge, 27 gauge needles, and they'll go right through that needle cap and get your fingers. So you might consider getting a needle recapper um, just so you don't uh, get bloody. But uh, there are resources available if you need assistance in locating some of these items. I'm gonna finish off here and uh, prepare to hand this off to, to Brian, but review again the documentation requirements in the chapter section nine. You need to have hard copy or electronic records of the kits you've made, the activity, the ingredients, as well as rate of chemical purity testing. So, Brian, can you take it from here and explain how you might capture this with a uh, department management system? Yeah, sure, Ken. So, Rich, great, really great, great stuff there. Um, let me go ahead and bring mine up real fast, and then we'll go ahead and go right into it. So, I know Rich talked a lot about this, right? And we really went through a lot of really big parts of this. Really, when it comes right down to it, there's a lot of information there, and he simplified it as best he can. Um, but certainly, as we look a little bit more towards this, what can an electronic department management system do or what should it be doing for you at a minimum and help you with a lot of the stuff that's going on here? So we're going to kind of run through that a little bit. We'll show you some examples of it and then we should be able to open it up for some questions. So first thing is really when you're looking at a, a department management system, you should be able to do your brand package receipt. That's at a minimum. Um, all the systems on the market do it today. Certainly uh, a good thing to have, but it should be able to do it. The part we really want to focus on is around your prepared radio pharmaceuticals, right? So as you're preparing these kits, you want to make sure you have formularies in place that grab certain items from that, right? As a minimum, you want to be able to act, uh, account for your activity, uh, your highs and your lows, kind of your range of your volumes as well and what your normal volumes might be. Um, it should walk you through the radio pharmaceutical preparation, should walk you through the QC, right? We should be able to walk you through that QC to be able to give you the QC results and do the math for you. So that's really what we're looking for. And an important part of that is, does it pass QC, does it fail QC? And what happens if that were to occur? Can I accidentally administer it to a patient because my system didn't stop me if it failed the QC process? We should be able to do that, right? Um, and then of course, we wanna be able to give you some of the other items that are associated with it. Um, probably the big one that around that is, what if you are using an SRPA or a clean room suite? Maybe you don't have the minimum one hour uh, immediate use requirements. So we're gonna go through some of that stuff too. And I can show you in an application really, let's drag it over onto my screen. And we'll kind of walk you through really what I think these things should be. So some of the items that we hit, right? RAM package receipt, already received the package into the system. So we already have that. I have my electronic data of it. I can actually go look at it, see what was received in it. Um, and then of course my incoming DOT report with that. Now, the other parts of that though, the one first one I'm gonna show you is really around a department management system that should be able to identify immediate use. So in this particular system, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna find the immediate use setting in this. It doesn't really matter what you call it, you just need to know what it is. The way this system is currently setting, set up, it's saying, do I have a sterile kit prep area, a SRPA, or a clean room? And if so, can I use extended beyond use date? I'm saying no to that. I am not, I am strictly a facility that is immediate use. I work in ambient air. So I'm gonna go ahead and say no, I'm gonna save that. Now with that particular setting, it should go ahead 
and apply all the immediate use rules. But before we get to actually preparing the kit, let's talk about the other pieces of it, right? So I wanna talk about the formulary. So when I go in here and I wanna look at my products, right? So I'm gonna go see what it takes to prepare a particular um, kit and how it's set up in the system. So this is my formulary. When I come in here, you can make your own formularies. There's some standards that should be built into your system that you're certainly able to make and edit your own. I have a few already pre-built in my system and I'll show you what those are. So grab Medronate. I know we talked a lot about Medronate in Rich's slide, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. What are the requirements to prepare a tech Medronate from a kit? First, you need a vial, right? So we're gonna say, yes, you absolutely have to have a Medronate vial in inventory to be able to prepare it. You also need to have sodium protecting tape in inventory. What is your activity, right? So here's, here's the two ingredients that were required to make it. Here's the activity I normally would put in that vial. So for me, I wanna make it with 50 millicuries. I never want it less than 10. I never want it greater than 500. And I'm gonna set my hours of expiration to six. That's on the package insert, right? Expiration time, six hours. Important to notice that because in my initial setting in my system, I went ahead and said, this is immediate use. So it's gonna apply some immediate use rules to that when we actually prepare the kit. Same thing with the volumes, right? So I now have a, a normal volume. I normally want it in two mLs. That's the volumes I like, but I should never be less than 0.5 and never greater than five. And then it calculates the concentrations for me. I am telling the system that I am going to require QC on this kit. It is a requirement now for me to perform QC for me to be able to use this kit and administer it to a patient. And it, of course, it's active. If I decided to never use this kit anymore, I take it out of activity. I can save that. And now I have that kit formulary prepared, right? So now I'm ready. You're saying that's great. So you have your kit, you can prepare it, but how do you do QC? So your systems, again, should be facilitating you in the QC process for this. So if I come in and I look at a product, and again, we'll use MDP because that's kind of the one we've been working with so closely, I can come in and find my tech Medronate. When I go look at my Medronate, I can then look at the QC that's associated with it. So again, you can, per, you can build your own QC templates and systems. Hopefully there's some standards built for you, but once these are built, you don't have to remember everything that Rich had told you, right? We know that the required USP is 90%. That's what the percent bound is requirement for, uh, for MDP. So now the system remembers that. It also knows because I chose the MDP dual strip process. This is my default program I'm gonna use that there is a dual strip, right? So, and it even is telling you the math that's gonna have to be done on it. So again, I don't have to remember the math now. Your system should help walk you through that math process. If you need to build your own, if for some reason there is not a QC program built in there, they should have the ability for you to be able to build your own QC programs. So I can build my own templates if I choose to do so. Um, pretty easy to do. Again, this is gonna be 90%. I do have a required percent bound. So if you do set your requirements higher than USP, you can do that. It will enforce that rule. In most cases, I'm guessing you're not going to, but it is available at least in this system. And then of course you build the you build the test detail around that, right? So then I can build my variables, um, origin in front, and then from there, what are my calculations? So the system has a lot of pre-built programs, a lot of pre-built templates in it. I'm not going to save this one because we're not going to use it anyways. But a good system should have that, right? You should be able to do it. Last but not least, we've got all this stuff put together. We need to be able to prepare a kit, perform QC on it, and administer it to patient. That's the ultimate goal. Right? And we should be documenting all of those pieces as we go along. So to do that, and I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because we wanna give you guys plenty of time for questions. To prepare a kit in my system, I said I needed a couple of things in there to make it, right? First thing is I needed Medronate. I have a Medronate vial, I have sodium protecting tape. I'm good. I can go ahead and highlight my Medronate vial and say I'm going to prepare a kit. I actually have five in, in my inventory, so I'm good to go. I'm going to go ahead and prepare it. I'm making um, tech Medronate. I'm performing it, so it's documenting who's doing it. Here's the activity that ideally would like to put in it. Here's my ideal volume. Here is the cal time, right? So my cal time is saying at 7.47 p.m. Eastern time, I'm preparing it. Even though I said it was a six hour expiration, it's not a six hour expiration. Well, it is a six hour expiration. It's a one hour beyond use date. So it's going to enforce the rule for one hour. I cannot cheat the system here. I can't, I can't bump the system out and say, take me out longer, I wanna pulse cal this so I can keep it longer. You can't, a good system shouldn't let you cheat the system. As I roll down through here, here's the Medronate vial, here's the prescription lot number that I chose from it. I'm gonna go ahead and choose my sodium protectant tape as well, and I'm gonna go ahead and put in the volume or the amount that I put in. So I'm gonna say I'm good, I drew up exactly 50 millicuries. 
again, this system's enforcing a lot of rules here. One of those rules is I'm puncturing the septum. Even though I have 132 millicuries left in that vial, I have to throw what is left in that vial of bulk tech or sodium protectantate away. So the system's gonna force me to do that. As I go down to the bottom of the screen, you can see I have activity uh, of 50.03 at calibration. And my final volume is 0.82 right now, but I wanna QS this up, right? So I wanna QS it up to two because I told it I wanted it in two. Now I need to add another product to it. So again, your system should be able to handle all of this. I'm gonna say I added saline to that. The manufacturer could be any manufacturer that you choose, right? So there's this is a complete list. We'll just grab 3M because it's at the top of the list. And then what's the expiration from that particular saline vial? We'll say it's a few days out, it expires at 2359 of that day, and it's 12 12 is the lot number from it. So finish on that. I now have added saline to that system as well. So when I print my documents at the end of the day, that's going to be on there. I can also hover over this and see that I added saline. The system's now going to force me to perform QC. I can skip around this, right? I can say it either passed. If you guys are doing QC outside of a system, I'm not sure why you would, but it is available. You can pass it. You can fail it. You can say I did not perform it. So this is the trick, right? The one thing that I do want to show you guys. So if I say I didn't perform it and I save it, I should not be able to administer this to a patient. I can't. So if I want to try to administer this to this patient, it happens to be me right now, I wouldn't be able to do that. There'd be no MVP available. However, if I go into my inventory, it is an inventory. I prepared that kit, but you don't see it, right? I'm in non-expired inventory. I don't see any Medronate up here. If I go to expired, I'm going to see it. Not only do I see it here, we actually, we actually put it beyond use date at immediate time. We actually expire it immediately until you perform the QC. It gives you a visual indicator that you have not yet performed QC. So you can do that, you can come in here, it's yellow, if it were red, it failed QC. If it were white, it's just a beyond the use date. At this point in time, I can come in and I can actually perform the QC. So I can click perform QC, I'm doing it now, and I'm actually gonna perform it. When I come in here, the system now does everything for you, right? So this is what a system should be doing. You should say, this is who I am, this is the time that I'm doing it, what's the, this is the, uh, quality control I'm performing, right? We have the two choices that we had available. I'm gonna choose the dual script. Here's the instrument that I'm gonna use. And here's the information directly off of it. Watch these require USB inbound and the pass fail as we go through this. So I go through and I put in my numbers, right? And I'm so far I'm passing, that's great. So it's done the first part, but it's not completely there because you can't finish it leaving these blank. So I'm gonna come through and finish some additional numbers. The good news is I'm above the required USP at 90.8. It's gonna allow me to pass it. When I click finish on this, I have now passed QC. It's now out and available for me administering to a patient. So it's those little stop checks along the way to make sure that if you are preparing a kit, it fails QC or QC is not performed, you cannot give it to a patient until it passes QC. So those are the pieces that we wanna make sure that we're forcing along the way. Last but not least, and I know Rich talked about this and we, you know, we don't want to rush over this. This stuff did not occur if you do not have documentations for it, right? So at the end of the day, you need to make sure that when you're all done, you have a report that can print out all the information that you just had. Uh, you know, you may want it today, you may want it tomorrow, you may want it six months from now. The, the system can store and hold those records for long periods of time until you're ready to pull those records. So I can come in, I can request a report. There should be a standard built report in the system that allows you to pull an in-house prep report. I can run it for today. I can run it for multiple days. I'll just run it for today. I can submit that request and see that report. So the report, there's actually two of them in here that I've already run. If I pull this report down, you're gonna see that this is the one that I ran for today. I can save it. I can print it. I can open it, whatever I need to do to review it. You will see on this report is all the required information that you need that you need, let me pull this up a different report, I just didn't like that last one, to be able to uh, give an, an auditor, an inspector, whoever it is, for the information that you're looking for. So as you look at this across the board, what you're gonna notice is I prepared sodium, or I prepared MAA, I used sodium protectantate, MAA vial, and sterile water to prepare it. it. May not be the ingredients you normally use, but they're certainly there. And all the information that's associated with the RX, the lot, the expiration of each of those products, whether it passed or failed QC, 
If you perform QC in the system, it will also tell you what the QC of that was. So as I look at this one down here, the Medronate, sodium pentate saline, I had a, I had a 90 point or required a 90%. I had a 92.5 and it passed. I must have done one earlier where I said it failed on this particular item. But all that information is there. It's auditable. You can look at it. It stays in the system forever, so you can always pull those records back out. So uh, Rich made it really simple um, to go through, and I and I appreciate it. It brought back a lot of the information that, quite honestly, I haven't done in years. And I think it's important to review that kind of information. But also that being said, you know what? We all did this at some point in time, right? We we were taught radiochemical purity testing and quality control back during our education programs. I know I was, I won't tell you how long ago it was, um, but it's been a long time since I've done QC since then. You made it simple. Your department management system should also make it as simple for you as possible. It's not that hard, right? Rich went through it. I mean, he broke it down into a couple simple steps. It's essentially break it down into those simple steps and perform it. You should be doing it every time. Why do we do it, right? The, the ultimate goal of why we're doing it is to make sure we're giving a pure drug to the patient, right? Because at the end of the day, what we really want is we want to able to image the patient's pathology rather than question whether it was radiopharmaceutical quality, right? If what we're seeing on the screen is actually something that we should be concerned about, or is it something because we just, you know, didn't perform that QC, we're not 100% confident that we're absolutely ready to go.